Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I'm Cairo. This is the Mind Meld Live video podcast from Shell Protocol. And uh, today we are talking with Emily from Uniswap. This has been a much awaited episode. Um, so we're very happy to have her on. We also have Viraz from our engineering team at Shell on the call. This is his first Mind Meld Live. And uh, I will let everybody introduce themselves. Kenny, do you want to start? Hey, what's up, everyone? Great to see you all again. Um, as returning podcast spectators know, I'm Kenny, founder and chief economist of Shell Protocol. I'm really excited to have Emily here. Um, this is a <clears throat> podcast episode I've personally been looking forward to for a while. Uh, Raj? Yeah, hi, hi, guys. Uh, very excited to be here. My name is Viraz. I'm building smart contracts at Shell Protocol and an EVM nerd in the space, so very, very excited to be here. Yeah, yeah we're uh, we're we're glad to have you. And uh, last but not least, Emily. Hey, I'm Emily. I am a smart contract developer at Uniswap. I've been here for about two years. Um, before that, um, I did some cross. Um, blockchain work, uh, like bridging, um, and I've, yeah, and I've been working on stuff like uh, like TCR since 2018 and prediction markets and stuff. So, yeah, been around for a minute, and yeah, super excited to be here. Are you still working on prediction markets and that kind of thing, or no, no, uh, not since endeavors. Yeah, 2018, 2019. They never really. Um, took off too much, unfortunately, but I'm still rooting for them. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Well, thank you again for being here. We uh, do have a live chat channel open on our Discord. If you're watching on YouTube, open up the Shell Discord and uh, go to the MindMeld chat channel. And uh, no screenshots, Kim. They're not necessary. Just kidding. Uh, if you have questions you want to ask the team, uh, come on and ask them in that channel. I will be perusing and I will voice them uh, here throughout the call. So please share your questions. Uh, to start, Emily, I guess good question is how did you end up at Uniswap and how has that been so far? Um, yeah, so, well, funny enough, um, back when I was working on like some prediction market type, um, um, products or, or projects, um, we needed an Oracle and we really wanted, um, something that was super easy and kind of on chain. And we thought like, maybe we could use Uniswap as some sort of Oracle, um, which was a little difficult and we faced a lot of challenges because we didn't want it to be too gameable. Um, obviously Uniswap came up with a solution to that in V2, uh, with, when they released their TWAP, um, time, Av time average t time weighted, time -weighted but... average <laughs> um yeah. price <laughs> but anyway um so um so we were integrating with them um back in v1 trying to somehow cobble that together <laughs> as an oracle for our needs um and so that's how i met hayden um, just kind of like in their Slack asking all these integration questions. And um, so later down the line, that's kind of how I ended up at Uniswap. Um, you know, I was in a phase where I felt like I could use a change um, and Hayden reached out because like we kind of, uh, you know, they needed a smart contract developer and I had been integrating a long time ago. So I would say that's how I ended up there eventually. And um, was there a second part to that question? Oh, how has it been, I guess? It's been really great. Um, it has been, I mean, I've been there a little over two years now, and it's been quite a crazy two years just because when I started, there was like 11 or 12 people, and now there's over 100. So um, it's definitely been a whirlwind. Um, but it's been really cool. Um you know, I joined on with like one of the most talented teams I've ever worked with um, from the smart contract developers to um, mechanism designers. Um, 
which, you know, Hayden and Dan did a lot of that. And um, yeah, it was just like a really, and it is still, a, it's a really exciting um, place to be. And I feel like we we get to kind of be at the forefront of all the latest um, things that are happening in Ethereum. Sometimes that gets to be us when we release a new version. Uh, but, you know, we continue to explore all the ways that we can continue to evolve with the space. Um, like, you know, I was on a panel recently, which is where I ran into Elisa from Shell Protocol. And, we we're, you mm. know, talking about how we were um, investigating 4337 because we do a mobile wallet now. So, yeah, there's tons of exciting stuff going on. And, yeah, it's, it's a great place to be. And you're uh, you're also working on this EIP, which is one of the things we wanted yeah. to talk about on this <laughs> call. Can you tell us? a little about that. Maybe Viraz, you can share a bit about your perspective on it as well. Yep. Uh, sure, I can start. Um, yeah, so we, my team has been involved um, in pushing this. I think one of our team members realized in just our research that we were doing that there is a lot of patterns that um, are difficult to accomplish. Um, especially when you're dealing with things as expensive as S stores. Um, so, um, I think that EIP was, um, proposed, oh my God, I don't know, maybe like, I don't even know the year, maybe 2018 or 2019, I can't remember, um, as a solution, um, to, you know, people were, were trying to come up with solutions because um, storage was really expensive, but a lot of people were using it um, not to write to disk. Um, Reentry C lock is a great example. Um, it's kind of like the classic example. Um, when you enter a function, um, you need to make sure it can't be re-entered. So a lock starts with an initial value. And once you enter, the value changes. And once you've completed the life cycle of that function and close it out, that um, value returns to its initial um, initial value. So you're never expecting it to be written to disk. And that was a big use case. And I think the um, original um, solution to that was storage refunds. You can refund um, um, a, a storage right if, you, if it's set back to its original value. Um, unfortunately, that is... It was capped to only 50% of the gas that you spent in your entire transaction. Um, and later down the line, it got changed to 20% of the gas that you spent in that transaction. So um, it, it, it wasn't, if you're doing a lot of S stores, you're not going to get those refunds. And then it's 20K gas, which is, you know, it's basically the most expensive op code. Um, and I think we realized that if there was a better way to use that type of storage, um, we would be able to improve a lot of the things that we were writing and planning significantly. Um, I'll leave it at that for now and we can go to Vera. That's uh, interesting. So, it seems like, well, go ahead, Kenny. I, oh. <clears throat> well, I think one thing that might be helpful, cause I know, you know, I know Viraz and I, and, and definitely, you know, I mean, like, we're very, we're we're pretty fairly familiar with like storage versus memory, and I think I have a high level understanding of what like temporary storage entails. But maybe some of the listeners uh, are less knowledgeable about how the EVM works. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I think it might be helpful um, if, if you could kind of go through like what you know what is why storage is so expensive, how it's different than memory, and like how temporary storage. Um, solves the problem that we have currently with like having to write and then rewrite storage and not use it as something to write to the disk per se, like you're saying, but as sort of like a play temporary placeholder within like uh smart contracts activity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just presented on this. I feel like, um, so yeah, there are two main types of storage in um, the EVM that, um, and that's S store and S load and M store and M load. Um, so 
Asor is written within the context of a contract, and that um, is kind of, it, like I said, it's expected to be written to disk, um, and it um, spans the lifespan of a transaction as well as beyond the transaction because, you know, if you're, you know, trading ERC-20 uh, tokens, for instance, those balances are tracked in storage. And when you've sent someone tokens, um, you want to record that memory or sorry, that storage. And um, and so that's within the context of a contract. Yeah. And then there's M store and M load. Yeah. And um, and unlike storage, um, not only do they not um, persist throughout the trend or throughout you know, multiple transactions and blocks, but they don't even persist throughout the transaction. They only persist within the call frame that you're calling. So every time you call into a new um, external function, um, you are then presented with a, a clean slate for your memory. Um, so obviously this can't work for something like a reentrancy guard because um, you might leave the function and now you have a new clean slate for memory. And if you want to um, re-enter that function with your new clean slate, you're not going to be able to track that it's been entered. Um, yeah. And so transient storage is like the happy medium between storage and memory. So like storage, it is within the context of a contract. And if you leave that contract, you can still access it through any call frame, it persists there. Um, um, but unlike storage, it will not persist through multiple transactions. The end of your transaction, it gets wiped, similar to memory. Um, and because of that, because we know it's never getting written to disk, we can price it a lot lower in gas. Um, but unlike memory, it will persist through call frames. So you always have access to it. Um, even if you leave the contract, go do other things and come back to the contract, all those transient items that you set will still be there. Um, and so that's good for reentrancy guards. And maybe if you want to do some complex accounting uh, within the contract while you're also kind of leaving and going and doing other things around, around the Ethereum blockchain. And so this new like middle ground type of, of writing, um, or I don't have the words, I'm not a developer, but this thing that's in between memory and, and storage is what is being proposed to be added with the EIP. Is that right? Or is does it already exist? Yeah. This is what's being proposed to be built into the EVM. It's an EVM change. It has been cleared for the next hard fork. So unless something drastic happens, it will be added to the EVM in the Cancun hard fork. I don't know when that's scheduled for. I would think in the next, you know, within the next six months, hopefully. Viraz, what's your perspective on this as an engineer working on Shell? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I came across actually the EIP last year and uh, after the first read, I was like, wow, you know, that we need, uh, as a developer, I understand uh, the pros and cons of the VM and how, and especially when you are, uh, you, uh, you know, aim to optimize as much as possible in terms of writing code, in terms of gas uh, and transient storage was a unique concept and a new concept, upcoming concept and uh, very much the need of the R. I would say, and that was my thought as well. And uh, I think me uh, and uh, once I like heard of it, uh, I think a lot of people, especially in Q4, were you know asking for it to be included in this upgrade, the Shanghai one. But unfortunately, you know, we get that from the like I get the core devs perspective that there were a lot of things you can only like include so much, right? Uh, so they had to like postpone it. But uh, I think what I've seen and what I've read about it. I'm pretty much uh, all for it, and uh, yeah, waiting for it to be including included as ASAP for the next upgrade. Uh, I think yeah, transient storage is going to be very very helpful, especially like MV said, uh, reentrancy lots. There are uh, you know use cases around where you need uh, you know single approval transactions, right? So you need to approve once, and you, you we can clean out the state. Uh, uh, so yeah, there are like use cases around that which are you know going to help with gas a lot because 
like she said, uh, with I think uh, the refund uh, EIP, right? That was I think EIP three five two nine. So there, the refund uh, percentage that you get uh, was like twenty percent reduced to twenty percent. So yeah, and I think it would really help with uh, keeping everything optimized. So all for it. <laughs> Now, Kenny, I have a question for you as well regarding this, but also just sort of like EVM changes in general. I feel like watching us develop Shell, develop the ocean, we very much like take the constraints and the gas costs of the EVM as a constant. And we say, okay, how can we optimize our code given that this is the way it is? Now, a proposal like this is almost entirely the opposite. It's like, we have things we want to do. How can we get the EVM to change to make those things possible, cheaper, better? I, I Do you think that says something about Shell? Do you, do you, I don't know. What are your thoughts on one versus the other perspective? Well, I think it's... Um... I think it's sort of a natural difference between, you know, when you're large versus when you're small, right? Because you see this in, in any industry, crypto for sure is, is, is like this, but, you know, larger players have more scope to like adjust uh, in core infrastructure, either like influence in terms of rules and regulations or just in terms of setting standards for for an industry and i think i think first of all i think this the changes i'm not a developer but the changes in in this um eip 1153 make a lot of sense to me uh i'm i'm savvy enough about the evm to to feel some of its pain points and this definitely is one of them and and I think also that in many ways, you know, Uniswap and everyone else working on the CIP is, is sort of in, in effect creating a public good for the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem because they're putting in the work of vetting it. They're putting in the work of, uh, shall we say, politicking, um, getting getting this sort of getting getting buy in from from the core key stakeholders in the Ethereum developer community. And all the other, you know, DeFi Web3 projects are going to get to benefit from the improvements and optimizations. I think, um, yeah, and I, I really look forward to, um, you know, for the next iterations of Shell getting to take advantage of, of the work that Emily and, and the Uniswap team have put into improving the EVM. Um, does that answer your question, Kara, or, or are you looking yeah, for Yeah, it does. Stuff? It does. Um, and I guess this is, I don't know if you have the perspective to answer this, Emily, but I'll ask it anyway. I feel like there's an external perspective that Uniswap, you know, obviously essentially invented the space as far as what we think of as an AMM and mm -hmm. then brought massive improvements with V2. And with V3 really did something quite bold. And now we've got this wallet, which, you know, the, the mobile wallet is possibly, it's possibly the cleanest, the best implementation of that idea, but it's not a completely new idea. Um, and there's kind of a sense that Uniswap is like refining what's already been done. Do you see there being this move toward like, another leap into something really new or is it more about making the things that are already out the best that they can be yeah maybe a little bit of both um so i think yeah a wallet is a huge space um to be in and uh, it's it's great to be able to um serve as an entry point and kind of tailor that experience that gives us um, ways that we can make it more seamless for users to interact with our apps. And so I think it makes it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, it's nothing um, super new, but I think um, one thing we do have is um, 
you know, our reputation for um, good interfaces and really good security. And so hopefully we can bring that um, to the wallet space with us. Um, and I, I do think like what Uniswap does best is like so far AMMs. Um, and I do foresee us, um, continuing to iterate in that space and to continue putting out, um, really great improvements for AMMs. Um, so we um, definitely still concentrate on that type of research and building um, and definitely want to continue at least bringing new, exciting things um, to the AMM space. Um, and um, we definitely, I think like first and foremost, we see ourselves uh, as a company uh, or an organization that um, gives financial like freedom uh, to you know as many people as possible, which means making it easy for as many as people as possible to exchange with each other and between tokens. I think inter-token exchange is something that we care a lot about, and we hope to continue to keep innovating, um, perhaps beyond AMMs, but whatever we can do to make it easy to, to create the best solutions for users to trade between tokens and with each other. When you say inter-token exchange, do you mean like just swaps? Yeah, let's say like I have like this token and I need this other token. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. That yeah so that's what I thought. I wanted, wanted to make sure I got it. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. It is a little vague. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know, swapping between tokens um, in any way, every way. Um, we are definitely uh, want to make sure that we're always on top of that space. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, well, I definitely think that that's something that's been a success. Uh, I think Uniswap so is pretty much ubiquitous for a lot of people when they have a token they want to swap. It's especially interesting because, uh, you know, as you may be aware, a lot of the the way that DEXs generate this TVL, their liquidity for their swap pairs, is through essentially token incentives you know, when they have a uh, gov token or some other kind of token that they're using to boost their yield. And obviously the uni token is out there and, you know, the yields for these uni swap pools kind of are what they are. And yet they've been very successful in maintaining their liquidity. Um, which yeah, I think, is probably I, think a good um, I think like the simplicity definitely, like we lend a lot. I think like a lot of our success lends to the simplicity of the protocol and not trying to bake in you know, all these weird um, incentive structures for holders or ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, you yeah. know, but it's, it's, it's tough, you know, it's a tough, it's tough out there to find a business model <laughs> in the crypto space. So I uh, definitely sympathize with that. Um, but, you know, we do have um, protocol fees if they're ever turned on, um, no one's turned them on yet, but it's still a possibility for uni holders. Um, but yeah, and also this is like kind of going back to something we talked about earlier. Um, it, it was nice that we were able to push this EIP. I think Uniswap as a big name helped a bit. Well, I think like I don't want to take away from like I think Moody Salem did a great job at finding this EIP and championing it and working really hard before he kind of had the org behind him getting a lot of people aware of it spending hours talking to so many people and I think where Uniswap as a big name really came in to help us was getting the dev work done I think we had resources to write tests for it um, um, help write a client implementation for it. And I think um, getting that work done helped us a lot in getting the EIP passed. And I think that's like what like Uniswap as an org brought to the table was um, that work done. But I do think like as an individual contributor, um, people like Moody and some of the other people definitely um, 
you know, work their asses off to like get the word out, go to tons of calls, go to tons of meetings. I think um, before the org got super, super involved in resource allocation to helping um, build out some of the stuff once people were pretty receptive to it. Do you, having, having been through this experience with this EIP, how do you feel about the way, you know, a bill becomes a law, I guess, as it were, that an idea turns into a proposal that turns into something integrated into the EBM. Do you think the process is working as intended? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. I think it's impossible to get a process like this super clean. At the end of the day, it's a bunch of people championing for things they think should be included. And that involves networking and knowing people and politics and who do I need to convince and how do I get to them? Um, you know, it's really people and, and it's and it's like governance in a way. So it's political. Uh, and I yeah. just I, I don't think there's any way to avoid that. Uh, but I do think um, people were treading lightly, trying not to seem like, oh, like Uniswap is getting their thing in because they're Uniswap. And we had a lot of blowback from some people. I will say like uh, like the worst one was like, it's like a conspiracy theory, like it's going to give us a competitive advantage and all this stuff. But I don't think that's true because everyone knows how it works. And uh, it wasn't even authored by us originally. Um, but um, one thing we did notice is um, a lot of people in this process are clients devs and they're not smart contract devs. So they don't understand why this is important and like trying to convince them that this is really good for developers, trust us, was really difficult. And I think it's why EIPs like 3074 um, and this one to an extent were really tough because um, you know, like, well, we have a lot of things to prioritize in the storage, like who I don't get why that I don't get why that's needed, because there's not a lot of representation from the smart contract developer side. And, um, you know, people obviously they don't want to keep tweaking the EVM too much. And so, yeah, it was just this sort of, I don't know, finesse and, and trying to convince uh, the team that developers needed this. That, that's Got it. One thing I've noticed in general is when there's like a, <clears throat> one party in particular that like sees all the benefits, but not, not a whole lot of the costs. And there's another party that sees a lot of the costs, but another, not a lot of the benefits. It's, it's a, it's a bit of a political diplomatic process to um, get the, get the, get the core devs are going to have to like bear, see the costs of this EIP. They're like, oh, well, this is making our lives more complicated and making our system more complicated. And then the core dev, like the smart contract devs are like, yeah, but this is going to make our lives way easier and make our contracts, mm -hmm. our systems way simpler and make Ethereum way better as a whole. And kind of, it sounds like it took, especially like, it sounds like Moody did a lot of the heavy lifting on like Convincing. getting both sides <laughs> to sort of see things the same way. And yeah, I mean, Moody, if you're listening, thank you very much. <laughs> we all, on behalf of smart uh, contract devs everywhere, thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, and and obviously there's a lot of people that uh, that pitched in and helped um, as well. Too many to name, but a lot of people from our team. Mark from Optimism got, got totally nerd sniped into this as well, and just really liked the EIP and started doing the guest implementation for us and came uh, uh, to DevCon and helped us, um, yeah, advocate for it. So that was cool too. <laughs> um, do you? But. Yeah. Do you um, how do I put this? It almost feels like you sort of have this vertical solidarity within projects or protocols where obviously like Uniswap people are all working toward the same goal together, no matter what your role is within the org, optimism, arbitrum, whatever. But there's also this sort of like horizontal slice of community where like, if you're a smart contract dev, you have this sort of kinship with other smart contract devs, even no matter which project they're on. Do you, do you feel that sort of across the space? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of my connections and mentors and friends and everyone are definitely of the smart contract um, 
variety of person. Um, so yeah, I mean, I consider that my network. And when I think of like, you know, my past and my potential future, those are the people I'm thinking of that, you know, are, are my community and like, you know, the people like who among these people are, do I want to be working with? So there's definitely that um, horizontal um, and even like Arbitrum, if you look in their code base, they have uh, code comments about EIP 1153 uh, about, oh, if we had this, this would make this easier. And like, you know, so clearly they yeah. are kind of into it, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah, cool. smart contract dev camaraderie. <laughs> It's pretty good. I can see that. <laughs> yeah, you see that as well for us. Yep, for sure. By the way, Sanchez, we had someone on the Discord saying that a Uniswap guy had stolen a Aloha shirt. Faraz works for Shell. <laughs> he's a uh, he's on our side. Yep. Nice. Um, Who has a Uniswap shirt? Oh no, Faraz, he's got a, a an Aloha shirt. Not oh, really, but sorry. sort of <laughs> that energy, that palette. And I, yeah. I, I'm not, unfortunately, it's a little cold today. Normally we try to break out the, um, <laughs> the, the Hawaiian energy. Yeah. Nice. And Kenny, you're, That's you're actually not place. on the islands as well right now. Right? I'm on the road. Yeah. But I am in a warm place. I'm in Miami. So <clears throat> there's no, so it's uh, not exactly tropical vibes, but pretty close. Are you going to Bitcoin like Miami? Actually, no, I was, I was going, I actually didn't realize it was Bitcoin in Miami this week until like I saw signs and I was like, oh my goodness, I, I was just, just doing a little bit of remote work. Um, yeah, I don't, I feel like we, at least on the shell side, don't interact with the Bitcoin community slash ecosystem at all. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm aware of like I'm following ordinals and BRC20s, I don't, by the way, brc20 I, it's kind of like a joke name right like it doesn't really mean anything there's no brcs <laughs> there's, no, there's no actual request for comment i don't know anyway regardless i don't have much personal contact with people building on on bitcoin um either i uh, boston is a was a pretty bitcoin heavy place for a while so i did get a lot of exposure but yeah not so much anymore Eliza, oh, by the way, Eliza is listening in and she says she wants to hear more about the Uniswap conspiracy theory. I guess meaning the theory <laughs> that Uniswap was going to gain some kind of undue advantage from the EIP. Um, oh, I yeah. guess the question that I have is, do you think theoretically, say there were some dark alternate universe protocol like Uniswap, that did want to gain an undue advantage through an EIP. Do you think that would even be possible? No. Or is it, uh, is it completely baseless? No, the client devs are way too already like on guard about that type of thing. I feel like it was even, it, I feel like just because in, in some ways, just because the Uniswap devs were the ones pulling for this. It made people more skeptical than they would have been otherwise because it's like special interests. Um, so like in a lot of respects, it made it easier because we had resources to like get some work done. So they didn't We're like, look, the work's done. The client clients have it. We wrote tests like it's all done. All you need to do is say yes or no. A lot of times people need to write that out themselves. So that is really what got us over the line. Um, but on the other Side, people you know the people who want to keep things as like pure as possible um i think it like they put a bad sort of impression in their minds about this being a special interest and that really made some people even more against it than they would have been otherwise so i think people are pretty vigilant about that and i mean with good reason like you don't want I think, you know, I think we're good at an, a good actor, but like it's definitely possible that, um, you know, people with a lot of resources want to push for stuff and then they can kind of make bad changes to the chain that are worse for everyone but them. Um, and it, it, it it's extremely important to be on guard about that. So, like, I don't blame people for being 
or like any of the client devs for being super suspicious of us. Um, some people on Twitter, I uh, like went really far and they had all these big, it was, it was like a conspiracy theory to them. Basically like we're a special interest now when we get to run the chain and we authored this EIP that's going to give us an advantage over everyone, just those types of narratives. But I it's just like, people find it fun to yeah. speculate on that stuff. You know, it's like a yeah. TV show in their head. They're just making yeah. up drama. Yeah. I, it was um, a specific person, but I, yeah, it, it was like, that was great the other thing is, is there's sort of this power law as far as sometimes it's like one or two people generating 90 plus percent of the FUD around yeah. something specific. Yeah. I feel like there's yeah. tiers of like making it um, in terms of how people like talk about you on the internet. Like the first level is, you know, people just ignore you, which is how most people in the world exist. So they sort of get ignored. And then the next tier is like there's like random strangers you've never met that have never met you saying that you're awful and talking, talking, saying bad things about you constantly. And that's how you know you've made it to like the next level. You're like, okay, random strangers care enough to like troll me now. This is great. <laughs> and then I think, I don't know if there's layers between this, but um, another layer is where people start to write conspiracy theories about you. And that's how you know you've really like, <laughs> things are, like rarefied here. Um, you know, I, I look forward to. The day when people are writing shell conspiracy theories because then i'll be like yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Um, as well i don't know if that was the first uh bonafide <laughs> official uniswap conspiracy but it was definitely one of the one of the bigger ones that uh made its way on twitter and so you know i think you know uh, snaps snaps for you guys yeah and and you know the community keeps us honest like people are really on top of everything we do and i do think that puts pressure on us to be the best we can be um because we like well, if we don't say we're doing this or we're not honest about this like someone on twitter is going to be for us you know it it keeps us honest so i i yeah it's it's ultimately a good thing and that yeah one of the things that we're very um uh, interested in just as people working on a DEX and, you know, allowing liquidity providing and all that is the idea of helping LPs figure out how much money or value they are really standing to gain or lose over a period of time um, as LPs. And obviously there's this idea of impermanent loss, but we're actually, we're having another episode coming up in June where uh, our, our guest is, going to talk about how this gain or loss can go much beyond impermanent loss is quantifying returns something that is like still in evolution at uniswap that you guys are looking into how to present or is it sort of just like you know provide the pool and let the market decide if it's worth it um uh, i definitely uh, if i understand the correct uh the question correctly mm -hmm. uh, i think i think we like to put out simple neutral infrastructure and let like the people and users and community decide whether um yeah whether it's it's worth it or not to lp and so far okay. we have tons of liquidity uh i think it's a bit hard to quantify if people are gaining or losing and that probably depends on people's strategies i do think I think it's hard to be a passive LP and, and make some good gains. I think like ultimately it's going to be active LPs that are, you know, it's probably, in my opinion, it's going to trend towards more active LPs, but you know, we're thinking about that and we're trying to see what we can do um, to help with that, um, you know, in the future. And there's other protocols like Arrakis, et cetera, that will kind of manage your liquidity for you so that it will um, be in that gain, but it's, yeah, I think it's hard to quantify, but it's definitely a real issue. I think if you're too passive, um, that potentially, you know, too much impermanent loss, you might not be coming out as on top as is uh, most ideal. By the way, guys, uh, again, if you're watching, please drop your questions in the Mind Belt chat channel on our Discord. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking my questions. Kenny and Varaz, also feel free to jump in with anything you want to know. I there was something I was following recently on Arbitrum um, with this. I don't know. I guess you'd call it a meme token, AI Doge. I think anything involving Doge is automatically a meme. 
And they have this sort of novel scheme involving like a very high transaction tax. It's like 15 plus percent gets burned and then sent back to buy ARB and all this stuff. And anyway, someone had created a uni pool and there was this sort of brouhaha because the way the token worked, your transactions wouldn't go through unless you set to something like 20% slippage. And the AI Doge team was like, Uniswap isn't like supporting our token mechanics the way we want. So we're going to like freeze the token or like freeze the pool or some, something fairly adversarial like that um, and go swap on Camelot instead. Um, do you, I don't know. It seems like Uniswap in that position sort of toes a very like neutral line where like we're not going to create custom logic for custom tokens. Is that something you actively sort of stand behind as a, as a <laughs> what are your thoughts? Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, differing opinions about whether um, token mechanics, whether we want to go out of our way to support token mechanics that are you uh, very unique because like ultimately like god there could be so many tokens that work in so many different ways and how do you like account for all of those use cases when yeah. you're trying to add and subtract so um yeah like fee on transfer and rebasing tokens are not something that the uniswap pools natively support and it is also not something that some people think we should support because um, <laughs> they don't necessarily think the mechanics are sound. However, like, you know, that's definitely a debate and I don't know if it's for us to decide. I think um, so I like this kind of this internal struggle, uh, but like, you know, in, in thinking about like, do we want to support a bunch of token mechanics, token mechanics that we feel are a little like sketchy or, um, you know, just accommodating everything's tough. Uh, we never went out of our way to support fee on transfer rebasing tokens. Um, um, but I think in the future, we do want to like make, we are, you know, as we brainstorm new versions of the AMMs, uh, we do uh, want to make it a bigger possibility um, for more. Mm, uh, you guys will probably just have to like have me back uh, later <laughs> because oh, okay. I, 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 <laughs> well, yeah, um, um, yeah hopefully it will become a little simpler uh, in the future um but yeah we don't support that right now and um i think um yeah like if they are, if you have a weird token you're going to need to maybe find another um protocol to support that so when before <laughs> um <laughs> we're definitely uh, you know, AMMs is what we do and we're always thinking about it and we're always researching it and we think hard about it. You know, we don't want to just like stop at V3 and have the world keep moving. So, you know, um, I think, you know, you can keep your eyes and ears peeled, but, uh, is that how you, eyes and ears peeled? I don't know if that's like the right phrase, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Just... Your eyes. I don't know about ears. <laughs> what do you do with ears? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, like we're, we're thinking about it and I don't know if anything's going to be deployed in the very near future, but um, yeah. But you should still keep your eyes peeled and your ears open. Will do. Yeah. Will do. Okay. Uh, well, that was a lot about, um, the state of the EIP, the state of Uniswap, all questions I had. Um, and it seems like our users are pretty content to just listen to this flow. Kenny, do you want to take this in whatever la final act you <laughs> yeah. think is right? I, I, yeah, I, I think I got a couple questions. So like, <clears throat> what aspects of Uniswap are you the most proud of? 
And then what aspects, if you lived in a perfect world, would you maybe change or, or adjust? Okay. Um, the aspects I'm most proud of is our track record with smart contract security. And I think the, not even just security, but I think the, um, the quality of our, our contracts and our codes. Um, I was always um, really proud to be on such a team of such talented people um, in mechanism design and smart contract code quality. It's just, um, that's just like a dream. Um, the thing that, I don't know how you worded it, that uh, could be improved or I find the most annoying or however you worded it, um, is I think we've done a good job creating neutral infrastructure um, for protocol. Um, you know, people always think we're going to cave and do like know your customer pools and permission things and like all of a sudden, I don't know. Um, but I think um, we stand by our values. Um, but obviously we are within the jurisdiction of the United States and our government um, is worried about, you know, things like um, that could potentially happen, um, like money laundering. Um, and so we need to, and, you know, um, our country doesn't, you know, we have the um, certified, oh, help me out here, certified investor um laws so like not anyone can own a security unlike the yeah. majority of the world um and so i think unfortunately like, it's been tough for us to bring all of our values to um our portal but we you know we need to respect and abide by um the jurisdiction in which we operate and so um we definitely abide, um, even though we don't feel like we can bring value to, you know, users in Iran or something, um, unfortunately, don't have access. And, um, you know, we do have to, you know, we did have to um, to make sure to do some research on money laundering, um, just take a minimal amount of data, um, just some addresses and, and to make sure that we're complying with money laundering standards, et cetera. Um, and so maybe that's, that's frustrating, but I think it's a necessary, it's, it's just necessary. And, um, you know, all of our stuff is open source and we do get flack for stuff like that. But, you know, people talk about decentralization. Um, our protocol is decentralized. I think like I'm excited to see more work on like front end, you know, bringing those values to interfaces and stuff. You know, anyone can create an interface for our protocol. So. Mm. Anyone can make an interface for our protocol too. Right. Um, and I think that we've definitely been inspired by the ethos of those that came uh, before, as it were, uh, and mm -hmm. continue to, to live up to that. Um, mm -hmm. Like you guys do. Baraz, is there anything else? I know you've stayed up late um, for this. Is there anything else you wanted to add from any perspective? Uh, I had a question actually for you. Okay. So uh, I wanted to know, uh, was there any interesting challenge that you guys faced while developing or testing the EIP, uh, you know, but the or, or on the code side of things, right? On the code on side. On the new side of things, uh, any interesting problem that you find uh, that you faced? Um, I think fortunately, um, and this I think is what helped us get it through, the EIP and transient storage implementation on the EVM is like, somewhat simple so uh, that helped us a lot uh, i wrote some tests <laughs> um um in like not even assembly and op code like i wrote some tests um, and that's kind of like i didn't do any clients implementations or anything um uh, i think like a big challenge is just um more so um op like operational and that um, there's a bunch of different clients in a bunch of different languages. Um, and so making sure those all got implemented, even if we were responsible for them was a challenge. But I personally can't speak to any like deep business logic um, challenges that we found in the code. I do know that like 
I think the Solidity team is going to have, like, it seems like it will be a bit of a finicky implementation for them from, like, what I see with their team. So um, <laughs> hopefully they are able to accomplish that with as much ease as possible. I know um, Viper has it implemented, but, yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah, I didn't really get too deep on, on the, the coding aspect. Yep, good to know. Cool. I got I got one more question. Speaking of Viper and Solidity, do you do you feel any like smart contract language being able to one day supplant Solidity, or do you feel like for the foreseeable future it's going to be Solidity and then everything else? Uh, I I don't know. Maybe because of the network effect, um, maybe Solidity than everything else. But uh, more and more, it's just like. You have to use like Yule and assembly to optimize your gas. And we're seeing more and more low level code in our repos, um, which is kind of a, you know, can be a bit of a bummer. Um, not having um, generic types and solidity is a big pain. It's like a very rigid language. And I find that I can't really keep as dry of a code as I can if I'm writing like a you know, a TypeScript or something. It's just, uh, yeah. And so I, I really hope that um, they begin to improve on just making Solidity feel a lot more flexible. Um, I think Viper is a little bit better at um, gas optimizing in their compiler. Um, but I don't see us making the switch anytime soon, but I respect that. And I totally respect the Viper team for being super um communicative and on board about the eip and engaging and working with us a little bit um so i don't know i've definitely um have been having more and more respect for the language but i don't see us like switching anytime soon the language and the team um yeah gotcha and i guess just out of curiosity for you personally emily if there was no web3 and no DeFi, what do you think you would want to do with your days life like in another in another world homestead and farm and live like off the land would be good. i have like some beehives and i'm starting to get into gardening i think like the whole like i'm also i was born in concord so this david henry thoreau like um self um god now i'm thinking too hard and i can't self-reliance um i think i like I came to crypto and I discovered Bitcoin because of these like ideals I had about self-reliance. And um, I didn't call it decentralization at the time. Uh, I forget what I, how I used to think about it before I, everything that I think about is framed within this like, web three context. Uh, but I thought it was really cool to have like these like freestanding currencies that were peer to peer. Um, and so that's just kind of been a philosophy for me even before I got here. So if I wasn't doing this, I'd just be like, yeah, like homesteading or something. Gotcha. Well, maybe Growing there's always like food down the road. I don't know. If I'm not making my own currencies, I'm making my own food. <laughs> well, not my own currencies, but helping form the yeah, together. <laughs> Anything else you or anyone else wants to throw in before we wrap this up. I really appreciate you coming on, Emily. This was fascinating. Hey. Oh, do you any, have to uh, I had anything to wrap up? Yeah, is there any, any oh. <laughs> words yeah, any of books you want to make? Yeah, um, any, any books or movies you want to show? Books or movies? What about video games? Oh, I've been playing Breath of, uh, no, not Breath of the Wild. I've been playing Zelda Tears of the, wait, Tears of the Kingdom. Um, so I'll show oh, that yeah, I've game. I've been seeing very entertaining wants. videos of that on my Twitter feed. <laughs> Uh, I'll show that game if anyone wants to message me about it and they're playing. I, I'm just like, that's what I'm doing in all my time right now. Um, but, you know, thanks for um, having me on. This was super fun. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're doing our best at Unisoft to uphold, you know, all the values like we always have. And I think we always will be no matter what people um, think. And, um, and yeah, go Ethereum. I'm I'm super bullish and happy to be a part of this community. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, yeah. Um, glad to be a part of it with you. 
Cool. And uh, we'll see you around. I'm sure Eliza will run into you in person before too long. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Thank guys. you so much, Emily. And, Thank and when, you. When you, nice um, you. When you have some some details about UDV four or anything else you want to talk about, gotta have you. We gotta have you back on the podcast at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah, come drop the tea on here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Yeah. See you Bye. later. All right, guys. Real DJ hours start now. Um, shell stuff. Well, collab is ready, right? That's what I hear. Yep. We're going to be oh, dropping man. the uh, collab airdrop. Finally, I think it's been a little more than a month, but blame cross-chain bridging <laughs> for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, what made matters extra complicated is like so if you if we wanted to bridge like a like a like a fairly liquid token like say like the OP token to Arbitrum, you know, there's like hot protocol and others that have the liquidity, cross chain liquidity for you. So it's like actually pretty easy. You just gotta pay them some gas and you're good to go. But for these long tail assets, uh like collab, um they don't have liquidity on these cross chain bridges. So we had to do it all manually at the like off, like manually take it off of optimism, put it into the L1, put it up into Arbitrum, figure out what like the new like token contract ID is on Arbitrum. And yeah. And worst of all, the worst part of all this was is that like, I was the person who was doing it and I'm like <laughs> probably the least tech savvy person on the team i, I don't know there's i might not be the I, i'm at least at the very at, at best i'm tied for for last place um on the yeah team I, team. I i think you've got me nice. slightly beat um kenny but no Cairo, you actually do all the collab land stuff on discord <laughs> like you you are a lot more tech savvy than i am um okay I might know a little bit about solidity in the evm but that's not really like tech savvy that's just like book smart so it's not like well actual. i'll say Problem one was that something in the optimism front end was not working for getting the collab tokens off of optimism. And we needed to like, Faraz actually took point on talking to the optimism team and the collab team and like forcing their heads together to fix this. So you welcome everybody else who tries to bridge these tokens because <laughs> we got it fixed for you. And I think problem two was that we were not really a problem, but we were like the first people to bridge these tokens onto Arbitrum, which means we actually had to create the contract. Is that right, Kenny? Well, we were the, f I don't exactly know what happened, but we had to spend a lot of money on gas creating the, um, yeah, creating the collab, uh, taking the collabs off of optimism. Getting into Arbitrum was like pretty reasonable, but getting it off of optimism. I feel like we probably had to deploy a whole ERC-20 contract or something. Yeah. But um, luckily now it is happily in the ocean, which means all your swaps will be quite affordable. Uh, what people are going to be getting is actually collab, uh, I believe, because it is ocean wrapped uh, for your convenience. Of course, you can unwrap it. You can even bridge it back to optimism if you want. I'm sure there will be some people who find reason to do that if the ARB opportunity is, is sufficient. That's just a healthy market. But our hope is that you keep it in the ocean and start earning points with it. Uh, it's going to be a little bit before we deploy the collab pool. And the reason for that is because we intend to use... I don't know if... I, can I talk about this, Kenny? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, we intend to use a time-evolving Proteus pool to seed the uh, collab pool with ETH. So it's essentially going to start with 100% collab and very, very, very high price, which we did not expect anyone to pay. But the idea is it's going to essentially work as a Dutch auction where the price descends and people start to buy the collab bit by bit until eventually it has reached a, sort of a 50-50 or whatever ratio we're going for, at which point it starts to act like a normal pool. So this is a pretty good way 
to sell anything for any other token on the ocean. You could do this with NFTs. You could do this with the token that you are uh, creating on the spot. And this is kind of like a technical proof of concept for that. Yeah. It's basically the, will be the, the precursor to what I guess you could think of as like a launch pad for new tokens, both fungible and non fungible on shell. And we're working on updates to the front end UI to support this. And this will probably be the last major feature update that we ship before shell token uh, and shell DAO is released. And so pretty much shell will become feature complete, not in its entirety, but feature complete kind of in its current form. Uh, once we get this, once we get these time evolving Proteus pools shipped and we have uh, like our launch pad sorted out. Veraz, you're the one who's actually been doing a lot of the work building this time evolving Proteus code, correct? How has that been for you? Yeah, it was pretty exciting actually. So uh, I think I came in like in terms of I started like testing uh, the math that was actually written before when I uh, started working on this. So, uh, and then we, you know, we uh, worked on refactoring and improving the test scenarios, the test coverage, et cetera. And then, and yeah, yeah it's been pretty fun actually to test it out. Uh, we like did some testing on test nets and then now we have some four tests uh, with fuzzing and everything doing uh, all kinds of scenarios. So it's been pretty exciting and pretty, pretty uh, looking forward to, yeah, just getting it out there uh, finally. Now, I can kind of pretend I know, but for people that don't know what fuzzing is in the context of building this, can you explain it briefly? Yeah, so basically the concept is that uh, there's a, a test case, um, you provide like random set of inputs to a function, to uh, to your invariant functions to, uh, in terms of, you know, testing out a piece of code. So you have written a test there, but more often than not, what you do is you use default parameters in your tests. So they are like any kind of uh, single values, but mm -hmm. with fuzzy, what you can do is you can provide random inputs instead of, you know, just fixing a value, fixing an input. So you can provide a range of inputs and which helps in terms of just testing how, uh, if the invariants break or not, uh, uh, as uh, you know, uh, like for time evolving Proteus, uh, as we, you know, go ahead in time, do the invariants break or not. So, so that, uh, that's the advantage it gives you rather than, you know, defining multiple input variables in one single test and just congesting everything. So you just, uh, you know, uh, have this feature, powerful feature with Foundry, for example, that we're using. So where you have these random inputs uh, that go into the test function and test, uh, you know, a range of inputs basically. So saves a lot of time and yeah, good uh, testing wise as well. And do we test with say thousands tens of thousands millions of different numbers how how extensive is this as far as the yeah so of... it's a it's a big range uh so there are like two kinds of uh, for example here uh, for time evolving Proteus, i think there were two set of sets of inputs one was of course the amounts the second was the time periods because uh the idea is that the curve is evolving uh up to a particular time so we have the duration defined until which it evolves. So we have to like test uh, whether uh, it evolves for till that particular duration and it stops evolving after that duration. So uh, yeah, it is like uh, duration is again, of course, depending on how much the duration that you've set. So the inputs are based on that. But for amounts, we are like using pretty high number. Uh... Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, Kim Nine brings up a good point about time evolving Proteus as far as UI, which is that what we don't want is we don't want users going to the swap screen and buying a given asset for way, way, way more money than they mean to, simply because they're essentially not reading uh, or not understanding what's going on, not understanding that it's an auction. Um, so this is something that we've thought about, and this is something that we are working on from a UI perspective, which is how do you communicate this information? Uh, I believe, you know, you can look at something like Foundry 
which does things like this. Um, there's definitely precedent in DeFi for presenting a clear interface. But as you know, one of the big things with Shell is that we really try to have everything run through this like core swap screen experience. So the question we have to ask is like, can we achieve what we need to within the swap screen or do we maybe need to, uh, you know, go beyond the swap screen into a new tab or something like that for this auction experience? Kenny, what are your thoughts on that? Well, for tokens like Collabland, where there's already, you know, a coin gecko price that we can look at that exists outside of shell protocols, I think a fairly easy UI UX problem to solve, which is what we already have, which is you look at so whenever the user says, I want to swap this much, we can tell you like how much your money you're making or losing based on the dollar value of the inputs and the dollar value yeah. of the outputs. So for this Collabland token, it won't be, I don't, I don't think we really need to do anything extra. It's a more complicated when we are dealing with tokens that don't have price discovery. So when we're launching a new NFT or launching a new fungible token, there's no CoinGecko API that we can look at because this this is this is sort of the the Proteus pool is like the source of truth for the price. And the whole point of this time evolving Proteus is to get um price discovery that um you know, is front run resistant and gives regular users a fair shot um, and also maximizes the revenue for whoever is selling the token. Yeah. And for that, that that's, I think, when we need to think about what type of interface we want to provide people. So I think no matter what, it'll, it'll you can still buy them with the same swap interface screen. But one thing that we're working on more generally is having like screens and modals that people can view for any type of token on shell that'll give the necessary information and metadata and, and price history of that token. So this will go for LP tokens. This will go yeah. for like stable coins, ETH, NFTs, et cetera. We're going to have custom pages for each type of token uh, that'll let people see what's coming or let, let people see like what they're, what they're interacting with. And we're working on the mo the thing that, that the, the thing we're working on right now, the thing that'll come out first is a custom screen for these time evolving Proteus pools. So that way and it it, it it's very, you know, I'll, I'll I'll be honest, it was heavily inspired by um Fjord Foundry, if anyone's ever used that protocol. Um by their front end, by the UI, that by the information they display on their UI, we felt like it was very intuitive. And, you know, my hunch is that there's going to be improvements we can make down the, down the road. Um, but I think it's, you know, one of the nice things about, about you guys, the community, is it, it's very easy for us to try things and get feedback and under, learn how to make things better. And so I'm sure, like, over time... We'll refine the front end, refine the interface to really give you the information that you need and make it clear and accessible. And yeah, but you know, in the meantime, you're always going to be able to buy things on the swap screen, no matter what. And then it's just like, if you're interested in, in how the auction's progressing, there'll be like a button you can push and see in, info about the auction and, and make your trade probably in that screen. Uh, that was a lot of details using words to describe something that's like visual that no one can see, but, but me in my head, um, I guess I've seen the Figma mockups, but I'm going off of memory. So if that's confusing, don't worry. Um, hopefully it'll be a hundred times less confusing when you actually see it in person. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. You know, Kenny, something I was thinking about, you talked about like the different levels of notoriety and like that people sort of interact with you differently and you have new experiences depending on how you know notable slash infamous you become we had an interesting experience the other day when we built the shell interface obviously it was very inspired by uniswap which in turn inspired you know all these other dexes um you know sushi dodo i think were some of the ones that that 
we looked at and decided what we like, what we don't like pancake. And obviously we took that and we said, okay, how can we do this the best way that we can? And we came up with our own elements, these various things that we thought would improve the DEX experience. And we drafted them and we built the interface that you have today. And just the other day, I was scrolling through Twitter and I saw a screenshot of an interface and I thought, well, it looks a lot like Shell. I think it was um, Osmosis was the DEX. Um, and I went, wow, we've gone to the point where we're not just being inspired by other DEXs, we're actually having our own UI uh, in turn inspire others. And I'm sure that will only keep happening. So um, sort of a milestone for us feels feels good, feels interesting. Yeah, shout out to the, to the design team. Yes. Maybe we should get one of them on here sometime, Kenny. It could be interesting. Oh, that would be great yeah. to have, like, Mateus on here. Yeah, Mateus, that could be really cool. We've got a bunch of hardworking designers. Oh. Man. Uh, okay, other shell tea that we want to get into. Um, obviously, Collab is coming soon, like soon. Um... One thing we've been talking about that actually I'd love community input at some point is setting the multipliers for existing pools. Um, because we have this vision for these in terms of like managing risk. And obviously now that the protocol is a little more mature, um, multipliers are this tool that we can use to optimize like LP behavior. And um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I know Sean has talked about like doing a toucan vote or potentially a crab vote to figure out the weights for the various pools. Um, I don't know. There are more questions than answers right now, but it's something to think about. Yeah, I think we definitely will probably recalibrate some of the multipliers like the ETHUSD pool. Um, That'll probably happen relatively soon. Like the next start of the mm -hmm. next season would be my guess. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Andy to lock three questions. Timeline estimate on the collab ocean update. Where did you find the developer joining you today? I believe that's Viraz. Um, who is the artist behind most of the shell and FT artwork? Uh, okay, I can give you answer the first one uh, pretty easily. I think it's coming out today, right? Isn't that the plan? I think I think the collab airdrop is coming. Yeah, out today. I think we're if dropping it today. Be... Is the plan? Yeah. After and this, the reason we don't this, this, like the sooner, have the sooner we shut up, the sooner you'll get your collab. <laughs> the reason we don't have more lead time on these guys is because we really don't want to overpromise and then not make our deadlines. So essentially, you know, the devs are working on something, and it's like, when is this going to be done soon? You know, we we get soon just as much as you get soon. And then at some point, you know, usually a Sean will be like, hey, this is done. We can ship it. And we totally could wait a week and be like, guess what? Next week, collab. But we're kind of like, fuck it. Like, if it's done, let's just ship it. So that's why we it goes from soon to all of a sudden, like now, um, is because we don't want to overpromise and we also don't want to wait. Uh, to phase change. Yeah. Um, and as far as the pool, I don't know. How long until the collab pool? I think we're aiming for June. June? Okay. Two, where did you find the developer right joining it today? Review. This could be interpreted two ways. If it's Veraz, I actually don't know how we found you, Veraz. How did we find you? I think we were referred. Someone else in one of our, like, VC cohorts referred yeah. Veraz to us. Right, Veraz? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the company that I was working uh, before this, so I think Kenny was in a, I think in an investment group or something on Teddy or something. So they, he actually sort of got me connected with Kenny. So that's how. And oh, Chandler yeah, says yeah. reveal the artist. Chandler says this because she was the actually the one that found our artist, by the way. Um, <laughs> So the guy that does our art is a guy named Alex Russo. He is an illustrator. Um, he is absolutely 0% plugged into Web3, which honestly is fine. 
He has other things to do. Um, he is, I believe, in Spain. And uh, he's a, a badass. Um, he really... We came to him with this vision for, like, the Shell world and Alice and Bob. And he's put his own fingerprint on it um, in a big way. So I... I essentially start like the storyboards for the shell art, you know, I'll sketch something and then he will turn around and make it professional is generally how these things go. Um, anything you want to add about our experience with Alex, Kenny? I mean, the guy is tremendous. I just hope he doesn't get hired by like Disney or some animation studio. I know. Um, yeah. Nobody poach him, please. Um, and, but uh, he's he's a very special guy, and uh, yeah, has contributed it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of fun to, you know, to watch. For me, it's a lot of fun to watch the the, the illustrations um, kind of unfold uh, from 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 the draft designs from from Cairo's like, you know, almost like Chat GPT like prompts for describing what he wants, and then to the the sketches to the drafts to the final product. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Um, so again, hopefully that will continue to be part of the protocol vibe for a long time because I'm invested in the story of Alice and Bob. And, uh, you know, I know at least a couple other people are as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, collab soon, very soon. Pull a little bit after that. Um, Pool party currently in the lead is reunit reuni. Um, oh my gosh, um, these reuni people are absolutely uh, very very passionate about their token. So it's always it's always funny to see. But that's kind of the beauty of governance, I guess. Um, and then I believe Stargate is in second place with GMX slightly behind. So. Um, if these things get approved by the toucans or crabs, however we do it, you can expect them to be added probably a few weeks after that. And um, anything I'm missing as far as the short-term roadmap, Kenny, Veras? I think we're just chugging I don't along. Think so. okay. Yeah, we're just, you know, execution, baby. Execution. I think... I think, yeah, the, the cadence of shipping will probably slow down a little bit as we transition to really focusing on delivering the shell DAO and shell token launch. And then once that's done, the cadence of shipping will accelerate again. Uh, we got a lot of cool... I think probably the most... The things that you're going to see the biggest changes uh, between, you know, now and the once over the summer is probably big UI updates. Um, I think the uh, the big like I think guiding philosophy for us as we build out the the shell app and the shell UI UX is it's like okay well fundamentally what do what are people like what are they trying to do well. The fundamental operation is like, you know, converting one form of value into another form of value. I believe Emily talked about this, like inner token exchanges and also sending value from one person to another. Um, these are all really, really core fundamental things. And the most important thing we can do for Shell is to make converting one form of value to another form of value as like easy and seamless as possible. And that's why we put so much energy and effort into making like our swap screen uh very flexible and like universal and very simple um and really the goal is uh anytime a user has to think about the swap screen and think about interacting with a swap screen that's like in my opinion a ux fail it's sort of like anytime you have to think about the touch screen on your smartphone or think about like the gps locator on your app um or think about the spell check. That that means that the, that 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 service is not working. Like it should be. The more invisible it is to you, the better. So we're trying to make this swap screen as seamless, and as mindless, and as simple as possible. But beyond just 
converting one form of value to another form of value, you know, what else do people want to do? Well, you want to be able to see what you have in terms of what tokens you have. You want to see what those tokens are doing for you. And you also want to be able to retrace your steps and see how you got there. And that's one of the biggest things that we're, we're focusing on adding in the short term uh, for, the, uh, for, for the app is, you know, ability to like, explore what's going on and see what these tokens are all about that you that you may or may not want to hold um and be able to see like what these tokens are worth what they used to be worth and also see like what transactions that i take that got me here and, then and the third thing you want to do is really information for other wallets that you find interesting what yeah is... exactly so like, the third thing is like well I don't just care about what I have. I also care about what everyone else has. I want to know what everyone else is up to. I want to know what everyone else is doing. Not necessarily in a, in a forensic way where I'm trying to like narc on them, but just in like a curiosity way of what's the herd, what direction is the herd going? And do I want to go with the herd? Do I want to go against the herd? And so those are the things that we're adding to the front end uh, shell app uh, in the coming months. And I'm, I'm actually really psyched. Um, Something we've been working on for a few months now, and should be ready. It'll probably be ready before the token launch, is my guess. And um, yeah, those are those are probably the biggest things on the roadmap, uh, and and that and and time evolving Proteus and the you know token launch pad. Kim asked about tokenomics part three. I think we've trapped ourselves in some kind of Sisyphean loop where. Whenever we release one tokenomics article, the next one becomes the the when. Um, but there it's are some serial. things that are worth discussing in that, uh, such as investors and, and et cetera. So it's going to be a little while, guys. I'd so, say a couple of weeks at least. Yeah. yeah. I think for, for me, like, I, I know about 90% of what I want to put in this article. And, you know, spoiler alert, there's going to be a part four. Um, no. but, uh, I, basic, <laughs> ba the basic, the basic, the basic thing where that's going to be covered in part three is, um, token lockups and how do we, you know, at a token, at the time of token generation event, there's going to be a ton of shell tokens created and given to people. And. A lot of these people have been waiting a long time for these tokens. Many of them are going to want a profit take. Um, and how do we, so basically, how do we create a system where these tokens are created, given to people, but there we minimize the selling pressure um, at the initial token launch? Because I think I think you know if if everyone just gets their tokens and starts to dump, that's I think not 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 optimal for the protocol um in general so how do we disincentivize uh token dumping while also giving people flexibility to pursue what's what they think is optimal for them and um yeah we have some cool mechanics on the on the, on, on how we're going to do token lockups and i don't uh, one one of the holdups of talking about it is is i think we're still going through and mapping out like the implementation and we want to make sure yep. that what we have in mind is actually going to be implementable. And uh, yeah, I think that's like the main bottleneck for, for releasing. Once we feel confident that the implementation is viable, that's when the blog post will be released. I don't want to give any details about it now. I think high level, all I can say is that one of the guiding principles is that upon token generation, everyone, regardless of whether you were a, a shrimp LP, a whale LP, uh, an investor, a core team member, a founder, um, you know, whether you're the insider of all insiders or just some passive LP who put in a couple bucks one time, the rules are going to be the same for everyone and no one's going to get special treatment, either like negative special treatment or positive special treatment. We're all going to be in the same boat facing the same trade-offs. And that to me, I think is very important, um, both from an ethical standpoint and from a practical standpoint. Um, Andy did ask something about 
uh, how we're taking into account U.S. regulation and Hawaiian regulation, being that they're fairly strict. I would say strict and ambiguous. Ambiguous being probably the worst part. Um, I, I think we'll get into it in, in future articles, but there are various solutions to this. Arbitrum obviously found their solution. I think you can look to our peers in D5 for, for some precedent, but um, we're working it out. Yeah. Fortunately, we don't operate out of Hawaii per se. Um, That's true. And there's a big difference between like the Shell DAO, the Shell Network, and then Calorie Labs, the company. Calorie Labs is far as I'm concerned, his primary role is to write open source software for shell protocol. Um, and yeah, I think really the main point of risk that's harder to figure out what to do about is, is the front end app because that needs to be hosted somewhere and that somewhere in practice right now is in like AWS server. And so, um, smart contracts are already pretty decentralized. We don't control them. And when the shell DAO is out, that that'll be even more the case. Um, I think in, in terms of creating the token, I don't, I don't want to go into the legal de details cause we haven't sort of finalized them, but there's some fairly well uh, understood well trodden paths of creating tokens outside of U.S. jurisdictions um, that will probably be something that we follow as well. So the real, the real, the real sticking sticking point to me is the front end. Unclear how much regulatory liability the front end has, and I think in the long run, if we can decentralize hosting of the front end, that would be, that would be pretty awesome. And, I, and it sounds like, and you know, speaking of Uniswap and, and all the other players in this space, this is a problem that not, it's not unique to shell protocol. It's everywhere. Yeah. Every protocol has this problem. And it's actually and reassuring so... to hear for how big and how us based Uniswap is that they're really, at least currently towing the line on their, on their ideals and not uh, having to either do any big flight or, or compromise. Um, so we'll see how that continues. Oh, you know what? We got an hour and a half through without losing Kenny. And I was just about to praise his Wi-Fi for, uh, for hanging in there. But I think just that thought might've jinxed it. So, yeah. This is probably as good a time as any to uh, to tune out and say goodbye. Uh, Viraz, anything you wanted to add or discuss uh, before we call it? Yeah, I mean, it's been an honor to be here and uh, a yeah. pretty good conversation with Emily and uh, between uh, all of us and about Shell and upcoming things. I'm pretty excited. Uh, yep. Me too. Thanks for staying up late and uh, I'm sure we'll have Kenny back soon. So, uh, yeah, everybody, aloha, be well, and we'll talk to you on the next one. Bye. Yep, bye, Rose.